uh, what do you do when you're at your wit's end? Uh, we've been looking for several weeks studying about when life caves in or when life falls apart or when you're going through various situations in life, what do you do? Uh, where do you stand? What do you hold on to? Uh, what is your um, foundational roots and how do you approach uh, all of the various things that come our way? Tonight, as we look at our, dis our, our study, we discover that our resources um, are in God and God alone. In the 107th Psalm for tonight, we're going to look at several things. In fact, one of the ways you can look at this particular psalm is you can look at it as um, a gallery. Uh, <clears throat> there are four different pictures that you see here in some of these verses. Uh, there's the desert scene or the desert gallery. Uh, and then you see uh, uh, the prison gallery uh, that is here. You see uh, uh, those that are sick or the hospital gallery. And then we see the storm gallery in tonight's study. And so what I want us to do is go through some of these verses and look at them. When you look at this Psalm 107 uh, as this gallery of four pictures, it illuminates the, the significant challenges that you and I face in our lives. And um, you uh, know that life is filled with all kinds of challenges, don't you? Any of you ever had any challenges? Any of you experiencing challenges right now in your life? Uh, well, life is certainly filled with those, and um, so um, there, there's one good thing that you and I can learn from it. I read the other day where a, uh, <clears throat> a construction worker had fallen 110 feet, uh, and so um, uh, he fell into a pile of dirt, and fortunately, he was very blessed that he only had a bruised lung and a sore back, but uh, the interesting thing was when the paramedics came to pick him up, the first thing he said is, don't drop me. <laughs> don't drop me. He had just fallen 110 feet and escaped all of that. And uh, so he says uh, to him, don't drop me. Well, I, I suppose that would be the natural response that each one of us would probably say, given the situation. But notice in the 107th Psalm, we're going to go down through some verses, and then we're going to capitalize on some specific ones. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endures forever. Now, I want you to notice the important thing of giving thanks. Whether you are in the throes of despair, whether you're out there in a desert wilderness in your life, whether it's a hospital situation, whether maybe it's behind bars somewhere shackled um, uh, in a prison cell because of all kinds of situations that people get their lives into, get themselves into, or whether you are out there in a storm in your life. And there are lots of people tonight that are in storms. I can promise you that all over the world tonight. People are sailing some very dark waters and uh, if you don't have uh, the Lord as your anchor, the Lord as your stabilizer in life, then when, the, when your ship begins to capsize out there on the sea of life, let me tell you, uh, you will have major, major problems because life is difficult at its best. And we are challenged so much in our lives as we sail through the murky waters of life. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, the psalmist said, for he is good, for his mercy endures forever. I love the book of Lamentations because it tells us that his mercies are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. The psalmist said in the second verse, Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, whom he has redeemed from the hand of the enemy. Now, as the nation of Israel wandered uh, through the various um, lands that they went to, going to uh, the promised land. You know, they journeyed through uh, enemy territory. There were always those out there that came against them. In fact, you and I tonight are living, if you keep up with the news, and I try to uh, uh, make more of a, of a diet of the news than 
to just uh, be bombarded by it every day. But there's so much anti-Semitism going on among the Jewish nation and the Jewish people that it is huge in um, our day and time. Let me tell you, as the Jewish people wandered through the wilderness, going to the various places in the Old Testament, let me tell you, uh, they understood that they were close at hand to the enemy that was out there. And when the psalmist said, let the redeemed of the Lord say so, whom he has redeemed from the hand of the enemy. Now tonight, I don't know what your enemy is that you're facing, what your enemy is that you are struggling with, but people have all kinds of things in life they're struggling with. <clears throat> they're struggling with health issues. They're struggling with um, separation issues. They're suffering from all kinds of anxieties uh, that are going on in their life. They're suffering from all kinds of addictions that are out there in their lives. Uh, you and I <clears throat> are suffering tonight at the hands of people that are anti-Christ, uh, that are anti-Christian, uh, that are anti-looking at us because we stand for Christian principles based upon the Word of God and so we face the enemy at large in our world every day that we live in. In the third stanza, he says, And gathered out of the lands from the east and from the west, from the north and from the south. And so he's speaking about this journey in life. And, and here they are. And then we see the first picture here in this art gallery in verses 4 through 9. We see a desert scene where people are lost in the desert life. Uh, <clears throat> becomes this desolate, barren, a wilderness where people are confused, where they feel uh, without hope. And the psalmist said they wandered, verse 4, in the wilderness in a desolate way. They found no city to dwell in, hungry and thirsty. Their soul fainted in them. And they cried out to the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them out of their distresses. And he led them forth by the right way, that they might go to a city for habitation. Oh, that men would give thanks to the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men, for he satisfies the longing soul and fills the hungry soul with goodness. Now, right there in those verses, four through nine, there, there are a lot of things there that we see as they're wandering through this wilderness that they are experiencing. Think about whatever wilderness you're experiencing tonight. Those that, those that are trapped in their mind, that are trapped in their bodies. Think about those tonight. Uh, walk down the halls of nursing homes. You will see it on a daily basis. Uh, many of you may be dealing with family members in your own life, uh, and you know how incredibly difficult that is, uh, how challenging it is, uh, the toll that it takes on the caregiver, and whatever the wilderness that you're in tonight, however desolate it may be, that you sometimes, you, you just uh, want to faint in your soul. You see, when you come to your wit's end, what do you do? Well, this, the psalmist in this particular psalm, even though it's a wilderness wandering, it's a desert situation, it's a time of confusion, it's a time of loneliness. It's a time of feeling separated from Almighty God. Do you sometimes feel separated from God? You know, oftentimes people use this expression. And um, in the past few weeks, uh, I, I hope that I clarified uh, to someone uh, this idea uh, about, uh, well, people say the Lord told me this and the Lord told me that and the Lord said to do this and the Lord said to do that. And, and someone just made the statement to me, you know, I know I'm saved. I know I have the Holy Spirit in my heart. And the Lord just doesn't talk to me like that. So what does this mean when people say the Lord said this and the Lord said that? Well, you know, my, my uh, summation of that is this. How does the Lord speak to me? Well, because the Holy Spirit, 
the third person of the Godhead, his job is to lead us into all truth. You believe that? Okay, so how does the Holy Spirit lead me into all truth? He does it through his word. What does his word mirror to me? It mirrors to me what is right and what is wrong, what is truth and what is error. Now, God does not speak to me in an audible voice. And I think the confusion that we lead some other Christians as well as non-Christians to believe is, well, when I use the Lord said to me and the Lord told me this, I think sometimes we would be better served if we clarified what we are trying to say so that we don't mislead someone to believe, well, God doesn't speak to me that way, but God speaks to me through his Holy Spirit through reading the Word of God. Do, do y'all get what I'm saying? I, I mean, sometimes, you know, God doesn't speak to me in an audible voice, but he shouts to me through the Holy Spirit in his Word. And that's the way he speaks to me, to lead me into all truth. Now, so that I would not mislead anyone uh, in any way, I think oftentimes we use that, the Lord told me, the Lord said to me, the Lord spoke to me. Sometimes I think that we are careless in using terms like that without clarifying to the hearer what we are trying to say. God, through the Holy Spirit, leads me into all truth because his word is truth. When I read his word, what is God saying to me through his word? God is speaking uh, precepts. Draw near to me, for example. That's a precept. The promise is, draw near to God and what? God will draw near to you. So whenever we say the Lord said and, and this and that, I think we need to be careful that we don't mi mislead and misunderstand people because some people take that to mean God is speaking in an audible voice as if I were talking with Hester and we were, uh, you know, we were going back and forth in conversation. And so I, I hope that I clarified that for someone who asked me that very question in, in the past a few weeks is that, well, this is what I believe they're trying to say even though they're saying it in such a way that it sounds as if that God is audibly speaking to me and I hear that. Now, most of us never have an experience like the Apostle Paul had on the Damascus Road where he heard a voice from heaven. I think if we were honest tonight, most of us could never say, I've heard the voice of God from heaven. Because the Bible says, how does he speak to us now? In these times, God speaks through his word. And so he leads me into all truth. Notice as they've wandered here, in verses 4 through 9, uh, they're crying out to God, they're in distress, they're in trouble, uh, they're, they're uh, calling up the, on the Lord out of their distresses to be delivered. And, and, and you and I find ourselves there every day. I mean, confused lives. Um, you know, many people that are caught out there, they're lost in a desolate, barren area of life. And they feel that they're without hope. And they feel that, that life is so confusing. And so in verses 4 through 9, we see that picture. And then in verse uh, 10, we see an art gallery picture of a prison. Those who sat in darkness and in the shadow of death bound in affliction and irons. I want you to think about people all over the world tonight that are in prisons. Let me tell you, America has so many people in prisons. There are not enough prisons to house the prisoners. Various things that have gotten them there. Some, as we have seen in times past, have been falsely accused and wrongly convicted. But there are many that are out there that have 
gotten themselves into all kinds of situations because of drug addictions or because of, uh, of anger issues and turning on someone. Uh, I think we need to always uh, be careful where we are to always realize that, you know, Solomon said in Proverbs 27, verse 1, don't boast about tomorrow. You don't know what tomorrow's going to bring forth. And I want to share uh, tonight, you might go on Channel 9 News or KSWO Channel 7. Uh, we've got a lot of security here tonight, and I appreciate. I hope you never fail to say thank you to John Bowers and Rick Lang and Danny Ford and all of our security team. Uh, because there's some things going on right now in our county that uh, somebody is threatening churches and casinos and, and uh, various things. Please be aware of your surroundings and who's around you and what's going on. But I say that to say this in verse 10. Many people do things that are so desperately wrong through either anger issues, through drug addiction issues, or whatever, hatred issues. They hate and therefore they do things that get them in prisons. Notice verse 11 speaks on about this because they rebuild against the words of God. Let me tell you, if all of the world tonight, if all of the world tonight took the precepts of God's holy writ, took the precepts in the Bible, took his commandments, lived by those Ten Commandments. And as Jesus said, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. Secondly, he summed up the rest of them, then to love your neighbor as you love yourself. Let me tell you, we would not have the prisons that we have tonight. We would not have the problems that we have tonight. Can you only imagine what kind of world would this world be if people lived by the truth of the words of the Bible. Because they rebelled, the psalmist said in verse 11, against the words of God. And notice what they did. They despised the counsel of the Most High. Don't you and I see that every day? Missionaries all over the world, the Christians in America, were being challenged because people rebelled against the truth of the Word of God. People despise the counsel of the Most High. The psalmist said, verse 12, Therefore he brought down their heart with labor. They fell down and there was none to help. Then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble. And he saved them out of their distresses. He brought them out of darkness and the shadow of death and broke their chains in pieces. Oh, that men would give thanks. Notice that once again. To the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men, for he has broken the gates of bronze and cut the bars of iron in two. And so we see a desert picture in some of those verses where people are wandering aimlessly, hopelessly. And then we see they are those that are shackled by prisons. And then there's a picture in verses 17 to 23 or 22, we see a hospital scene. Fools, he says, because of their transgression and because of their iniquities were afflicted. Their soul abhorred all manner of food and they drew near to the gates of death. Then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble and he saved them out of their distresses. He sent his word and healed them and delivered them from their destructions. Oh, that men would give thanks to the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men, let them sacrifice the sacrifices of thanksgiving and declare his works with rejoicing. Now, tonight on your outline, Roman numeral number one begins with verse 23. Let's look at storms, the last picture in this art gallery of Psalm 107. We see here a storm. Those who go down to the sea in ships, who do business on great waters. They see the works of the Lord and his wonders in the deep. For he commands and raises the stormy wind which lifts up the waves of the sea. Let me tell you, sometimes you and I have to wade out into the deep. 
as the scripture says, launch out into the deep. I tell you, life's stormy seas. Uh, you see, we think it's safer, closer to the banks of, the, uh, of where the water began. But let me tell you, it's out in the deep things of life, out in the deep waters of life, where you and I are taught things that we could never be taught close to the shoreline. Launching out into the deep. Let me tell you, to launch out into the deep uh, not only it becomes a risky, a, riskly, a risky, excuse me, place in life, but it's also where God does his greatest work. Think about that for tonight. It's also where the greatest storms of life are. Launching out into the deep. Sometimes in our churches, we launch out into the deep. We do different things. We do them a different way. We try new things. We experience new things. You see, sometimes those are risky, but at the same time, it's where God teaches us. It's where God grows us. It's where God oftentimes leads us. And so the place of the storm in your life, maybe some of you are on, on the shallow edges or the fringes of the murky waters of life. Some of you are out there in the deep. Some of you are paddling your boats and uh, you're trying to figure out where you are in life and what do you do in life. One of the greatest challenges that I see among young people today is that they are treading uh, some waters that your generation uh, never treaded. They are treading a path. There are some great remnant of young people out there in this world who are uh, standing up for the cause of Christ. And they're standing up for Christianity. But yet at the same time, there are lots of young people out there in the world that, that they are, uh, you know, they're trying to figure life out. They're trying to figure out what is this, this all about? Who can I trust? What can I believe in? Where can I anchor my ship in the stormy weather of life? But one of the challenges that I find among the older crowd of people is twofold. Health declines and the death of friends. And the incredible loneliness of those storms and where that leads them and when that, where that takes them in life. And so the place of the storm, sometimes we create our own storms. Hello? Y'all out there? Sometimes we do it ourselves. Sometimes Satan creates the storm for us. Sometimes God is the one that leads us in the storm. But when he does, it's because he's trying to teach us a deeper truth about life. He's trying to take us to a place where we can expand our faith and trust in him and in him alone. Notice secondly on your outline, verse 25. For he commands and raises the stormy wind which lifts up, which lifts up the waves of the sea. Now, lots of Christians don't feel very comfortable with this idea that God will cause storms in the lives of people. But let me tell you, God is the creator of the wind. Amen? We sing a song. Can you remember this song? I'm sure he's the master of the wind. So oftentimes, we, uh, our storms are created by the Lord because he is teaching us trust in him. Let me tell you, if you're out there floundering on the sea of life, and uh, let's say your boat has capsized. You're not a swimmer, but you did put on a, a life jacket. What, what are you trusting in to keep you afloat? You're trusting in that life jacket, aren't you? Well, let me tell you, sometimes we're out there on the sea of life and we don't have a life jacket on. And God is taking us through some murky waters, some trouble sometimes in order to teach us to rely on him more fully, to teach us to trust him more completely in our walk with him. And so the producer of the storm, according to verse 25, for he commands and raises the stormy wind, which lifts up the waves of the sea. Remember that old song, Master, the tempest is raging. Remember Jesus is in the back of the boat. 
Jesus is asleep. The storm comes. The disciples are fearful. I mean, where else better to be than in the boat with Jesus, who is the one that creates the winds, the one who can cause the storms, the one who can say, peace be still, and all is calm in the murky, troublesome waters that you are experiencing in your life. Thirdly, on your outline, verse 26 and 27 speaks about the peril that's in the storm. They mount up to the heavens. They go down again to the depths. Their soul melts because of trouble. They reel to and fro and stagger like a drunken man and are at their wits' end. Have you ever been at your wits' end? You just, nothing was going right. Everything was going wrong. You prayed. You were earnestly seeking sincerely, God, answer this prayer in my life. Lead me in the direction that you want me to go. And yet, and yet you just really felt absolutely nothing. You, you didn't feel that you were getting anywhere in life. Let me tell you, it's during those times. There's an old song that says, standing somewhere in the shadows, you will find Jesus. And how true that is. He's never more present than when we're sailing on the stormy seas of life. In the peril of the storm, you can trust him. You can praise him. Look at verse 28. We see the prayer in the storm. Then they cry out to the Lord in their trouble, and he brings them out of their distresses. Remember over and over the nation of Israel I mean, they'd go along great for a while. They had a good king, a good leader. Uh, you know, if it was a godly king, a godly leader, uh, he would lead them into the worship of the one true and the living God. But if it was a, a godless leader, which they had many times, oftentimes they would stray. They, they, would, they would go from the presence of the Lord, what would God do? He would uh, bring up a rogue nation out there such as the Canaanites or the Philistines or the Cushites or the Amorites or whoever it may be. And God would use those enemy nations to come against his own people in order to drive them back to their knees where they came and confessed to Almighty God and refocused, reconnected, got their lives back into order the prayer and the storm to cry out you see i think that the psalmist here speaks about how wonderful it would be if all men would cry out to the lord who is the merciful everlasting god number five verse 29 and 30 notice the peace that's in the storm he calms the storm so that its waves are still then they are glad because they are quiet Aren't you grateful when you can travel through quiet waters? Aren't you, aren't you glad when the wind and the waves die down in your life and, and you're, you just, you're just absolutely sailing on calm seas rather than on seas that are uh, filled with the ups and downs and the waves of life that are crashing uh, you wherever you are and what you're experiencing the peace that's in the storm let me tell you he is the peace Jesus said to those disciples my peace I give to you not as the world gives Jesus said let not your heart be troubled neither let it be afraid aren't you grateful tonight that your peace is in the Prince of Peace Aren't you grateful that in whatever storm that you're in, whatever ship that you're sailing in, regardless of the rudder, regardless of, of whether or not the planks are falling apart and the water is seeping in, aren't you grateful that you can cry out, Oh God, you are my shelter, you are my refuge, you are the everlasting God. I call upon you. I'm trusting you to walk with me through these waters that I'm traveling in so the peace in the storm then verse 30 uh, the last phrase there on verse 30 notice what is the purpose in the storm so he guides them to their desired haven let me tell you wherever you are tonight wherever your ship is moving and going and and wherever it's floundering around out there on the sea of life just remember God has not forsaken you God has not forgotten you God knows where you are. God knows you by name. 
God knew your situation uh, long before the foundation of the world was ever framed in form. God knew where you would be tonight. God knew what would be taking place in your life. God knew the storms that would become coming in your life, whether they were self-created by me and by you, or whether they were storms that were created because of somebody else, or because of Satan, or because God just sent a little storm in our life to bring us to a more desired haven. And then notice, he says in verse 31 and 32, he begins the praise. After the storm is lifted, after the waters are calm, let me ask you a question. Do you just pick up and go on with life, or do you pause to praise him? Do you pause to praise him? Do you remember when those ten lepers came to Jesus? Do you remember there was one that turned around and thanked him? The rest of them went on their merry way. So oftentimes in life, we, we get so caught up in our own busy world that we, when the storm is lifted and the rain clouds have gathered back into the heavens and the seas are calm and our boat is sailing more steadily in life, do you praise him and thank him for the storms he's brought you through? David said, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow. Aren't you grateful tonight he's with us through it? He will take us safely through to the other shore. And notice the praise after the storm. Oh, that men, oh, that men. You know what I would say tonight? Oh, that America, oh, that this world, oh, that every living human being, answer that, it could be from heaven. <laughs> notice, oh, that men would give thanks to the Lord. Notice for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. Let them exalt him. That means to lift him up also in the congregation of the people and praise him in the assembly of the elders. He turns rivers into a wilderness and the water springs into dry ground. The other night on, on uh, one of the stations on television, they were talking about how that in the last days, how that Israel will bloom and blossom and bud forth and how that it's doing that right now. Uh, what used to be a dry and a barren and desert wasteland is now uh, growing with production and all of that. Notice verse 33 in this praise. He says he turns rivers into a wilderness and the water springs into dry ground, a fruit land into barrenness for the wickedness of those who dwell in it. That's why he does it there. Notice for the wickedness. He turns a wilderness into pools of water. Israel is an example. And dry land into water springs. There he makes the hungry dwell, that they may establish a city for habitation and sow fields and plant vineyards, that they may yield a fruitful harvest. He also blesses them, and they multiply greatly, and he does not let their cattle decrease. When they are diminished and brought low through oppression, affliction, and sorrow, he pours contempt on princes and causes them to wander in the wilderness where there is no way. And that's what I said when the children of Israel would stray and wander and every man would do that which was right in his own sight over there in the Old Testament. Notice God, he would cause them to wander in the wilderness when there is no way. Yet he sets the poor on high, far from affliction, and makes their families like a flock. The righteous see it and rejoice, and all iniquity stops its mouth. Whoever is wise will observe these things, and they will understand the loving kindness of the Lord. The psalmist, I believe, was saying to you and to me tonight, Whatever the situation, whatever the storm, remember to praise the Lord. Amen.